to be together today. Welcome to those who might be joining us online or perhaps from the fellowship hall. We are glad that you're here for this time of worship. I want to welcome those who might be visiting us this morning. We're glad that you're here as well. Uh, if you're a visitor, we'd like you to know that part of this bulletin can tear out where there's the information for a guest. And so we would love for you to fill that out and leave that for us in one of the offering plates following worship today. For giving of tithes and offerings, you can uh, place those in the offering plates here at the front of the sanctuary or at the back uh, following the service today. Additionally, you can give of tithes and offerings online at firstbaptistfarmville.org, also by dropping off here or mailing uh, uh, to the church office during the week. You'll see inside of our bulletin there are a few announcements, and I'd like to highlight some of those today. Um, next Sunday, uh, we have a couple of uh, big things going on on October the 17th. The first is the blood drive that will follow uh, worship um, from 12 to 4 p.m. And here's some of the um, important information for you to know. And um, I see there are some, I think there are some handouts that are here at the, uh, on the altar table if you'd like to grab some at the end today. Um, and uh, we've been getting this out a little bit over the past few weeks as well. But um, big information you'll want to know is it's from 12 to 4 p.m. Donors must wear masks and need a photo ID. Uh, volunteers must wear masks also. Uh, you can reserve your appointment online or sign up on the sign-up sheet provided on the altar table here. Um, and there will be a one power red, power red machine. Um, I don't know exactly what that does, but it sounds cool. So um, I think it does something with your, makes, uh, multiplies the blood in some way. I don't know. I haven't studied on that, but there is a one power red machine. And if you want any more information about that, I guess you need to Google it. Um, so other information uh, uh, important for next Sunday, the youth have a, a cool event going on uh, next Sunday from 4 to 6 p.m. They are going to be going trick-or-treating, but you don't have to prepare uh, your yard by decorating it for Halloween or wearing a costume yourself or giving them candy. They're actually coming around to collect uh, canned food. You can leave the cans um, in a bag on your front porch. And so um, I asked Chris this morning, they're going to have basically a directory and kind of go right around, find houses that are on there. So if uh, you are not in the directory um, and, would, and are going to plan to participate in that, please let us know in the office so we can let them know so uh, they'll know to go to, to your residence um, next Sunday from 4 to 6 p.m. would like to also uh, let you know you've seen this in the newsletter and in bulletins that on October the 24th, following worship at 11.30 p.m., there's going to be a special dedication of the Farmville uh, Town Hall Fountain in, in honor of former mayor and uh, longtime member here at First Baptist Church, uh, Robert L. Evans Sr. So uh, that'll be following worship, and we hope that you'll uh, be able to go down to uh, the town hall uh, following that time. Uh, we do also want to let you know that the fall festival that was scheduled for yesterday for the youth group um, to, to raise, um, they, they were going to collect canned goods as an entry fee for that, and also they were going to uh, collect clothing for the um, Kennedy Home uh, Children's Home in Kinston, that has been postponed and rescheduled for October the 31st from 4 to 6 p.m. And that will be right before our trunk or treat, which uh, Holly Sloan is going to come and share a little bit of information about the trunk or treat now. I'm very glad to be back. So thank you for all the prayers from last week. I am recovered. Um, it was not something that was planned. Trip to the emergency room never is, but all is well, all is good, but I did feel all your prayers. I do want to say thank you, and I'm really glad to be back. So, Trunk or Treat, as um, Graham said, is going to be Sunday the 31st, right after the Fall Festival. We are doing a Candyland theme. It's going to be really fun, really exciting, um, but I need your help. I need trunks. Um, we have a sign-up sheet for trunks right here. I need you guys to come put your names down, your contact information. And if you would like to do a themed trunk around Candyland, we would love it. Not required. If you want to do your own thing, we welcome that too. But if you want to pick a section on the board and say, I'm going to be a Mr. Mint truck and have peppermints all over the place, we would love that too. Um, so whatever you want to do, but if you will... Please come after service, put your name, your phone number, and if you already know your theme of your trunk, write it down. If, do, if you don't know, 
that's fine. I'll reach out to you later um, just to make sure you're covered and you know what you're doing. But we need your help to make this a success. Last year was so much fun. And in the middle of last year's COVID chaos, trying to put it together and figure it out how it's going to work, it turned out really well. And this year we know it's going to be even better. So please, 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 you're coming out for the fall festival from four to six. Stay, do a trunk, and enjoy trunk or treat with us and see all the kids of the neighborhood from six to eight Sunday night. We also need candy. Candy, candy, candy. We go through a lot of candy on these nights. So when you're in the grocery store, pick up a bag of candy and drop it off every time. <laughs> we need lots and lots of candy. I cannot express how much candy we go through in that particular night. We almost ran out last year because I didn't have enough. We didn't, but it was by the skin of our teeth. So we need lots and lots and lots and lots of candy because we sell a lot of kids last year, and I feel like this year we're going to see more. So candy and trunks. Please, please, please pray about it, think about it, and come and join us. It's going to be so much fun, and you will truly be blessed for it. Thank you. To, to those opportunities to welcome the, our neighborhood and our neighbors um, here for, for a good time. And if you would like to drop off any of that candy during the office hours, Nell and I will uh, we'll taste test it before passing it along. We'll leave you a little bit. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Holy God, we thank you for this time of worship. God, we thank you for the unity that you've given us through uh, being brothers and sisters in your family and give, gifting us with the Holy Spirit that, that, that always bonds us and always moves us toward one another with compassion, with love, with grace. We thank you that as we gather to worship today that you're, that, that, that you're eager to lead us to uh, to, to allow us to, to give you our burdens um, as we uh, place those at your feet as we worship you in spirit and truth today. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our psalm today comes from Psalm 9, 7 through 14. But the Lord reigns forever, executing judgment from his throne. He will judge the world with justice. And rule the nations with fairness. The Lord is a shelter for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, O Lord, do not abandon those who search for you. Sing praises to the Lord who reign in Jerusalem. Tell the world about his unforgettable deeds. For he who avenges murder cares for the helpless. He does not ignore the cries for those who suffer. Lord, have mercy on me. See how my enemies torment me. Snatch me back from the jaws of death. Save me so I can praise you publicly at Jerusalem's gates. So I can rejoice that you have rescued me. This is the word of God. Why? 
song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. My hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Our New Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of James, chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise up. Raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of, right, of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain. And the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over the multitude of sins. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. God, we again give thanks for, for this family. We give you thanks for what you're doing in our midst and the ways you continue to build your kingdom using this body. God, as we celebrated last week, we're part of a global family, brothers and sisters united under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And we give you thanks that today on this holy day, the Lord's day, we are, we are able to gather and able to worship God, we give you thanks for all of creation. We give you thanks that while we live in, in, in a world that is broken, God, there's also beauty. We give you thanks that you're in, in the process of establishing your kingdom. You did so beginning with Jesus Christ, your very self, coming to this earth to live among us, to love us, to offer us grace, mercy, and the ultimate sacrifice of his life for our salvation. We give you thanks for the spirit that you have gifted to us that continues to guide us. And so we pray that we would be open to what the Spirit continues to do. This morning, we, we, we know that our, our prayer list um, needs attention. There's brothers and sisters who have various needs, and so we lift them up to you. We lift them up for healing. We lift them up to have peace in, in their lives. We lift up their families as they, uh, as, as they 
support them and, and, and nurture them and care for them. And we pray that you would show us how we are to come alongside them. Lord, we continue to long for the day that, that, that the, the phrase COVID-19 is behind us. We long for that day, Lord. Uh, yeah, God, we also we, we acknowledge that when that day comes, Lord, there are many, many whose lives are forever marked by its destruction. And God, we pray that you would show us how we can be grace, how we can be truth, how we can be life in the lives of those who suffer, and how we might come along those alongside of those who grieve and help them in that process. God, we give you thanks for the day when, when sadness and grief and mourning and pain and all those things will be no more. But God, we recognize that in the process of, of that day coming, you're calling us to, to, to join you in the partnership of your kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. We give you thanks that we have the gospel, the good news, to anchor our lives in. And we pray that we would always find our, ourselves faithful to the calling that you give us. In Jesus' holy name, we pray, and in Jesus' name, we continue to worship. Amen. Well, my kids come down. Hey, Margaret, how are you? Good. <laughs> well, good morning. How are y'all? How are you, Ellen Ivy? Y'all good? Good. All right. Do you know what this is? What is it? It's kind of a little box of knitting. It's called a sewing kit. Now, this sewing kit comes in handy when, like, you've got a hole in, like, your shirt or your sock. Now, personally, if I have a hole in my sock, I just toss the sock. I don't try to fix it. I'm not that good. But if you've got a little hole in the seam of your shirt, this little kit comes in very handy. You take, you open it, and I had to buy a new one because I have lost all my needles in my old one. So apparently I can't open this one. There we go. <laughs> and you take out this little red sleeve. What are those? Are they needles? I'm going to take a needle out. And we're going to take thread. I'm going to get a dark color because I think they're easier. But what do I know? All right, I'm going to undo some. Now, is it easy to thread this needle? <laughs> Somebody else said no. <laughs> I was going to say, I am in agreement. So we're going to see if how easy it is to thread this needle. And y'all might get, uh, um, get to laugh at this I'm, because I'm not good at this either. Sorry, I have to lick it. Not very sanitary, but it's just me. Oh, I thought I had it. I was like, I did good to get it that quick, but I didn't get it. Yeah? Let me see. You think I can do this? I was kind of like, maybe, maybe. She's got a little bit of faith there. Ella, what about you? Can I do this? No, Ella's like, no, you're not going to do this. I'm not doing it. I don't have the skill today to do it or the patience to do that. But it does bring us to our Bible lesson today. There was a man who approached Jesus and says, what do I have to do to get into heaven? Jesus is like, well, do you know the commandments? And the, the man says, I have followed the commandments until since I was little. Now, how many commandments are there? There are ten. There are ten commandments. Now, I'm going to put you two on the spot. Margaret's probably the only most innocent one of all of us here. She's probably the only one that can honestly answer this question with a yes. Have you followed the ten commandments 100% your entire life? And not even broken one a little bit? That's obey your parents, don't lie, don't cheat. Oh, they're looking at each other. See, so that tells you right there that, but you know what? 
if you turn around and look at all the adults in the room, <laughs> everybody here is in the same boat you are. We have all at some, some point in our life broken a commandment. But this man in a Bible story says he has not. He has obeyed the commandments his entire life. And now this man was very wealthy. He had a lot of money. So Jesus is like, this is what you need to do now. You need to give everything away. Give all your money, all your belongings, give it away and come follow me. This made the man very sad because he loved his money. He loved his belongings and he did not want to give them up. And he didn't. He turned away. (laughs) Even to get into heaven, he wouldn't give that up. And that's kind of sad. Because that's what we're called to do is to follow God, to give up everything to follow him. And this man could not do it. Can we is sometimes the question as well. It seems like an impossible task, like threading this needle. This needle can be threaded. I think it even gives you a little tool to help you do it. And Jesus says that for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of heaven, it's easier for a camel. Now picture a camel. This is this big animal, right? It's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle, which is that little hole right there. You see? That little hole right there, it's easier for a camel to get through that hole than it is for a rich man to get, mm hmm. Yeah, it's like, oh my gosh, that seems impossible. But you know why it's not impossible for us to get into heaven? Because nothing is impossible with God. With God, everything is possible. And we can get to heaven through God. So you follow God, love him, and trust him, and you will get to heaven, okay? Let's pray. Creator God, thank you so much for allowing us your love, for giving us your love. Help us to remember that it's through you that we have eternity with you and through your son. Help us follow you. Help us to lay everything down at your feet. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.
I'd like to ask you this morning, if you have a copy of God's Word, to open it to Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 31. I'm going to just read the first verse of the selected passage for the day real quick. This is Mark chapter 10, verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Eternal life. If I was to ask you to define eternal life, you probably would start speaking about what happens after we die. Give me a little nod if that's probably where most of us think that that immediately takes us. Eternal life. We see in the scriptures that the word life that is translated from the Greek is zao. You want to speak a little Greek this morning with me? That's an easy one, right? Zao. I didn't hear you. Zao. Zao means to live, breathe, and be among the living. Basically, to not be dead. But we see in Jesus that there is a type of living, a type of life, a Greek word that is introduced in the Gospels through Jesus that is translated for eternal life. That The root comes from zao, but it's the word zoe. You want to speak some more Greek? Help me out. Zoe. <clears throat> Zoe is the state of one who is possessed of vitality, of absolute fullness of life. The Christian definition is the life real and genuine, a life active and vigorous, devoted to God, blessed. In the portion, even in this world, of those who put their trust in Christ, and then after the resurrection to be consummated by the new ascension, among them a more perfect body and to last forever. For Jesus, when he came to his disciples and began his ministry and he talked about eternal life. He didn't just talk about something that starts after death. He talked about something that started here and now. And so over the next, this week and the next two weeks, I'm going to be preaching a, a sermon series called Living Eternal Life. The topic that I want to think about today is how generosity is wrapped up in living an eternal life. There's no doubt that we, are, we, we have great hope that, and promises from Jesus that when these bodies cease living zao here on this earth, that there is going to be life that we experience after that, life after death, eternal life, zoe. But it starts here and now. It starts when we put faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to read the passage and I want to bring a few thoughts that I think will be helpful for us as we navigate the world and the context that we live in today. I'm going to read again from verse 17 and through the passage. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, but what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. And Jesus often asked, answered questions with questions. No one is good except God alone, Jesus said. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions 
and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Inherit eternal life. What must I do? We have the, this is the rich young ruler. We see, uh, we, we don't see all of the, here in, in, in this, we, we see that he's rich. We're told another, in the synoptic gospels where we see uh, this same passage in, in uh, Luke and in Mark, we see um, where, you know, many times the gospels had uh, the same stories in them, but there were different angles that the disciples or the eyewitnesses would have seen this through. And so it's, it, it's imagine there's an event that's happening here in our sanctuary and and people are looking through this window and one through this window and one up in the, in, in the back. And people are seeing it, seeing it from all different angles and then they're reporting on what they saw. There's these minor differences. But we gather from this same story being told in two other Gospels that this is a rich young ruler. A person who has a lot of things good going for them. Who comes to Jesus and shows humility. He falls on his knees before him. He calls him good. And then he asks him a question that reveals something about him. What must I do to inherit eternal life? This was a man who was accustomed with being rich, young, and a ruler that he could get his way by force. But an inheritance is something that you can't get by force, right? Inheritance by nature is a gift that is handed down, a gift that is given. And I'm sure there are some instances uh, probably that get taken to the courts where those sort of things happen by force. But the, the, basic, the, the basic rules of inheritance are that they are a gift. This man comes to Jesus with a misunderstanding of the kingdom of God. That he, the kingdom of God is something that he can earn by his good works. And so he asks the question, Jesus, what must I do? To inherit this eternal life. And Jesus then asks him some questions. He, asks, he, run, he starts running him through the Ten Commandments. And let me tell you, this guy is pretty good. If he is, if he is actually truthful, that he has upheld these from, from a very young age. Jesus says, you shall not uh, murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he says, I've I've kept all these from my youth since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and and he loved him. And he had hard words for him, but words of life. Words that were going to lead this man down the road, down the path towards living eternal life. He says, you've lacked one thing. We see something going on here in this rich young ruler. This rich young ruler has rationalized Missing the mark in some areas of life because he hid it in the others. You remember the, the Greek word for sin? Hamartia? You don't have to say that one. I know it's a little more advanced than Zoa and Zoe, Zao and Zoe. And hamartia, it's, it's to miss the mark. It's like there's an archer who is shooting arrows at a target. And anytime they don't hit it in the center, they've missed the mark. Sin for us is missing the mark that God has set before us. And we see here, I think that is something that we see in our own lives, is that it's very easy to rationalize missing the mark in some areas because we've hit it in others. It's very easy to rationalize sin. And that's what the rich young ruler is doing. I think there's a question as we move forward, and Jesus leads this rich young ruler to 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 look at his possessions, to look at his riches, to look at the things that he's accumulated and how he, he, th- there's a lack of generosity in the way he deals with those and with other people. I think there's a question we all probably have here is, does Jesus have a problem with riches? Because we, you, like they did there, we, we today, we believe, there's kind of this predominant belief um, just in our culture is that people who are successful, people who have lots of money, lots of riches and resources and possessions, these are people that God has blessed. I remember going to Cambodia on a mission trip, and there was a fellow who went with us that he would describe himself as being a pot belly guy. I mean, he was just a big guy who had a big belly, and all the people flocked to him in Cambodia. 
and they would rub his belly. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Okay, I mean, it was straight up, I mean, it was just, there was a lot of weird things in Cambodia, but that was really weird, and he was eating it up. And he had been told before he went that, that when you go to Cambodia, people are going to make some assumptions about you. They're going to make some assumptions that because you look well-fed, that God has richly blessed you. Okay? That, that and, and, you know, they don't see anything he has at home and that sort of stuff, but they're just taking, looking at this guy and that was the assumption that they were making. I know that's, I know that's weird, and in our culture, that's very weird, you know. Um, and, and generally, we don't look around at, at each other and do that sort of stuff. But if we're honest, I think we all know, we, we, we all have in our mind the wealth of the other people around us. And that's not a healthy, that's not a healthy thing to keep in our, in our minds. Not, not a healthy thing to, to affect the way that we behave. And it's not that Jesus doesn't like riches. It's not that God hasn't blessed those, but God usually calls people in different journeys in their lives. Sometimes God richly blesses people to be a rich blessing to others. Sometimes people call, God calls people down a road that is not filled with rich blessing, and yet there's still a rich blessing to others. So why does Jesus get so harsh with these words about the rich entering the kingdom of God? That's a question I have. Why is he why is he harsh with this rich young ruler? The truth is that as we accumulate riches, we are tempted to trust in our possessions. We are tempted to, to trust in the powers that we've had and the ways that we've accumulated them and acquired riches rather than in God. Our ultimate security and comfort be- becomes what we have in the bank or what we have at home or fill in the blank of what we have worked to acquire. This is why Jesus says that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. It is hard to let go of the immediate basis of our security and our comfort. And the more that we have, the more we accumulate, the more possessions that that, that come our way, the harder it is to let those go. Amen? You ever heard of people, you know, the more they make, people think they, you know, how many of us, we'd all raise our hand, could you do it with a little more money? Okay, you get a little more money, and then what you end up doing is you, you, you buy other stuff, and then you need a little bit more, and then you, you buy more stuff, and then you need a little bit more, and, it, and, and it, it, never, it never ends. You know, Jesus, we, we hear these words, the camel through, fitting a camel through the eye of a needle, and I kind of had hoped Holly would just keep going, because that, that is hard, isn't it? Anyone ever, I'm, I'm the sewer in the family. I mean, Gina has a, a sewing machine, but like when something is just like messed up or whatever, like, I'm like, where's the needle and the thread? And I'm just going to kind of do it myself. And she, but she, like, does more, you know, elaborate things. But, but that is always the most frustrating thing where I about lose my religion. It's just getting the thread to go through the eye of the needle. Attempts have been made here in, in, in my research this week. I tried to read a bunch of, a, a bunch of uh, different scholars to try to figure out, you know, was it possible? Like some, some people have said the, word for, the Greek word for camel is similar to the word for ship. And there was a small place in that region where ships had to pass through. And some might have referred to it as a needle. So maybe Jesus was kind of, it seems harsh to us, but maybe it was, you know, for, it's a possibility. Or maybe, you know, there's a, uh, a, there could have been an, a, a, a hole in the wall, a, a place, a gate where people could come through. And camels had to crouch down and go on their knees to get through. But pretty much what I found is that Jesus is speaking in hyperbole here. It's harder to get a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter the heaven. Enter heaven. It's like when I tell Luke and Levi on a Saturday that I need to do stuff around the yard and they're just, you know, if you've had children, they make a bigger mess. Like you're trying to clean up stuff and they're making the bigger mess. So it's like, it's just like this thing that just compounds and gets out of control. So I tell the kids we have a little area behind the bushes in our backyard where they can dig. And I told them if they keep digging, they'll get to Australia. Okay? And it kept them satisfied for like 10 hours one day. Kept digging and digging. And then along the way, they found what they thought might be a tomb. And so we were, it was like something hard, which ended up just being a brick. But we were thinking, you know, we're going to have to call CSI to come and see what's going on back here on the back of this property. But Jesus is speaking in, in, hyperbole, in hyperbole here. You know, we can't dig through the earth and get to, you know, China or Australia to the other side, come up, you know, in an ocean and then the ocean comes to the other side of the world, whatever, you know. We can't do that. 
Jesus is speaking in hyperbole. He, he's, he's, he, he's speaking, he, he's saying something that is, that, that, that is exaggerated to make his point here. It's harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. So what's the antidote for trusting in our possessions for salvation? Trusting in God. There's, there's, not a, there's not a book you need to go out that has 17 steps of how to work through this. It's easy. Repentance. Repentance is a 180 from the direction we're going, trusting in whatever and trusting in God. The antidote is not to just to give everything away as Jesus is telling this rich young ruler. It's, it's trust in him. It's trust in, in God. With God, all things are possible. Verse 20, um, verse 26 through 30, Jesus says to, to his disciples, the disciples were even more amazed, and they said to each other, who then can be saved? Probably, I don't know if amazed is the proper word for that. I think they were just frustrated, probably. Who can be saved? And he, Jesus says, looks at them and says, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. So let's talk about that for a minute. Does God call us to, to leave our families? You know, we're... We, we live here in the United States. We've been blessed to be in a, a country that has the freedom of religion. We're able to freely gather like this. And so we, we read this through a lens that I don't, you know, other religions may experience. Think, think about a, a person who is a Muslim and they trust in Jesus for salvation. That family kicks them out. They lose mother. They lose father. They lose brothers and sisters. They lose friends. For us, we don't, we don't experience that kind of thing normally in our culture. But Jesus is telling, is telling them that no one who has left home and, and, and left all and, and, and choosing to follow Jesus into the kingdom of God will fail to receive a hundred times as much, verse 30, in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. The antidote for trusting in possessions for salvation is trusting God and being generous with our possessions. First Baptist Church is a church that has existed for over 100 years because of the generosity of men and women who've come before us. We're in a building right now that has, has been generously give, given to for, through tithes and offerings. Our ministry is a, the, the building across the road that our youth gather and Chris leads it has, is a building that this church generously purchased. We have, just last week, the news of a, a new instrument for this church that has been generously given. An organ here that was generously given. Pews that you sit in that have been recently generously restored. We, we exist through tithes and offerings, through generosity. And God's call to us, and God's call to all of us who are rich and if you've ever looked at the statistics, if you live in the, in, in the United States of America, you are among, just by living here, among the richest in the world. We may look around and say, oh, this person I think is richer than this person. And when we all look at each other, we see rich individuals. We are wealthy. God's call to us is not to just throw it all away. God's call is for us to be wise in the stewardship of our resources. You know, I'm, I give thanks that for the tithes and the offerings that are given so that we can do the ministries that we're called to do. We see in the scriptures that there's the biblical command that when we're in the family of God, we're to bring a tenth of our resources together to support the ministry, to support missions in our community. And I'm thankful that we do that. I mean, thank, I'm thankful that we experience that. And, 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 and that has to be an overflow of a relationship with God where we experience the generosity of God and it flows into our generosity with our resources. And I, I want to commend this family of faith as we continue down the road ahead and, and do that. But as is often with Jesus and the way he taught, he would teach in one area of life 
and it was to transcend the other areas. He would normally start with the physical and it would lead into the spiritual and other relationships. And so if I've studied the passage this week and prayed through this, I believe that the great call for us today in living eternal lives, living lives that are vibrant, experiencing the kingdom of God here now, October 10th, 2021 and beyond, is not only to be generous with our resources, but to allow the generosity to go into other areas of life. The giving of our wealth can actually be very easy compared to allowing generosity to to filter into the other areas of our lives. Living and giving generously in relationships with others is hard, but it's an essential call of Jesus today. I've already shared this scripture a couple times since I've been here, but it's one God keeps leading me to over and over again. Y'all know I like the book of Colossians. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, Paul writes this to the church. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. We're called to live Live eternal lives based out of generosity. Generosity is one of the doors through which one of the keys that we unlock the life eternal. The rulers and authorities and values of this world do not lead us. Do not lead us to live eternal lives of generosity. We hear things like this. Whoever isn't for us is against us. You ever heard that? Jesus says in Luke 9, 50, whoever isn't against you is for you. If you're not first, you're last. Jesus says in Mark 10, 31, the first will be last and the last will be first. I've been trying to get Luke and Levi to understand that. It takes a while, doesn't it? How about this one? I served the second church I served. There was a guy who thought this needed, he needed to add this verse into the Bible. He said, you know, the Bible says God helps those who help themselves. You ever heard that? And I was like, no, it doesn't. Well, it should. <laughs> we don't see that verse in the Bible. But we do see that Jesus promises in John 16 that he will send a Holy Spirit that will guide us into all truth. And it will actually lead us to do the very things that he did and more. We are called to live lives that are generous. And that leads us into eternal living. Choosing to follow Jesus and being generous with our resources and generous with our relationships is not easy. Amen? It is not. Did you see the reaction the rich young ruler had in verse 22? Raise your hand if you saw that he just, he walked away and was refusing to follow Jesus. Y'all see that? Thank you for getting it there. Let's, let's, let's read through T- verse 20. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy, speaking of those commands. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. We saw it this morning in Holly's children's message. I'm so glad she went there with it. Our assumption is that this man decided not to follow Jesus and to walk away from his call. But Jesus says, go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. How do we not know? Why do we assume that he didn't leave to go do exactly what Jesus told him to do? We assume that when we follow Jesus, that it's going to be super easy and filled with joy and 
We're going to be on top of the mountain. But y'all, sometimes we have to go through the valley to get there. We assume that this rich young ruler was not going to follow Jesus. But could it be that he was, he was leaving because he had decided to do exactly what Jesus had told him to and there was a mourning to that process? That it wasn't going to be easy for him to do that? You know, taking the first step is not an easy thing to do. Those first steps are hard, aren't they? You see that with children. Those first steps often end with a crash into a coffee table or, you know, various other hard surfaces. First step's not easy. Cutting the check. Giving the gift. Asking forgiveness. Extending forgiveness. Calling the counselor. Having the hard conversation. And working through the issues. We are called, though, to live eternal lives. Not worldly lives. We are called to be on a plane that is above and between the world and the ultimate reality of complete peace in what we call heaven. But taking that first step is not easy. Taking the first step is not an easy thing to do, but as Jesus told his disciples in verse 27, he looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things, all things, say it with me, all things are possible. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you're calling us to live these lives that are a representation of your kingdom on this earth. God, we thank you that we've been called into this, to this holy way of life, to be good news to those people around us. God, we give you thanks for the way that you have blessed us. And, and God, we sometimes find ourselves being like this rich young ruler, having more than we know what to do with and trusting in it. God, would you lead us to be generous with our resources, to be a blessing to those around us. But not only, not, not only with those resources, but the resources of friendship, of, of association with others, with leading others. God, show us how we can be your hands and feet and demonstrate the generosity that you have shown in, in giving your very son for us. That while we were still sinners, Jesus, he died for us. He didn't blink an eye. Like a lamb led to the slaughter. As a sheep is silent before its shears, he didn't say a word. He willingly laid himself down. The gift that we don't deserve the grace gift, the gift that actually brings life. God, I thank you for this family. I thank you for the ways that you have, have brought us together in diverse, from diverse places and the ways that you're, you, you are making us to be a symbol of unity and of love and of grace, a, a symbol of the body being the body of Jesus, that when people look at us and see the way we live among each other, that they see Jesus at work in our relationships. God, we pray that we would continue to follow down the path that you have marked out before us. God, we continue to, to ask you that, that, that you would grow our ministries and, and grow our influence here in the Farmville area, that, that people would be led to Jesus to find life where there is not life right now, to, to find an eternal life that, that, that maybe they thought was only possible after life ended here, but is actually available to them now. God, give us courage and in, in the, the time that comes ahead, if we need to respond and reach out to, to someone about these things to understand that we're called to do that, that we are a great resource to one another, that we are a gift that you've given to the body, the fellowship of believers. We give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for your word. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. And may you go in peace. Amen.